Torah TV. The world is thinking. What we, what we really set out to do in this chapter, as in other chapters, is to take an economic look at something which is usually not looked at in a very economic uh, way, uh, and to strip away any ideas about like kind of what's right or wrong, what we, you know, you know, feelings of do what we owe to the next generation, etc. And really answer a simpler kind of more of an engineering question, which is we know that the earth has gotten hotter. Uh, we expect it will get hotter still. Okay. And the usual solution which is offered for cooling the earth is to produce less carbon. Okay. And we uh, say that we don't think that is a very good solution to the particular problem of lowering the temperature of the earth for three reasons. The first reason is that even if we were to cut carbon emissions, emissions dramatically now, uh, because carbon dioxide stays in the air a half-life of something like 100 years, uh, it'll be many, many decades before, uh, before we feel the effects of, of, the, of, of the cooling. So in, in essence, the planet will continue to warm for, for another 40 or 50 years. It just doesn't seem like you know, if you had another option, you wouldn't want to wait that long. The second is that uh, uh, how in the world we're actually going to get the kind of consensus and the behavior change that will lead to dramatic reduction in carbon is a very, very thorny question, and one that economists I think about a lot and think that this kind of collective action is very, very difficult. The third one is the cost, that the, the people who try to estimate the costs of this kind of carbon mitigation come up with numbers like it will cost uh, a trillion dollars per year, essentially, to the end of time to do this kind of, of uh, mitigation. And a trillion dollars, it doesn't seem like that much anymore, but when you really start thinking about it, it is a lot of money. Okay? So we try to say the question, well, what if we really were in a jam, okay? and we wanted to really cool the earth in a hurry? Okay, we didn't want to wait 40, 50 years. Is there another option? Okay? And we explore scientific solutions uh, that come under the rubric of geoengineering, where the science is pretty well understood. And, and uh, uh, you know, let me give, there, there are, there are um, really three we talk about. The two, there's one that's incredibly repugnant to people. Okay? And that one is uh, based on actually mimicking nature and what happens when big volcanoes uh, erupt. And so when Mount Pinatubo uh, blew in 1991, it sent enormous plumes of sulfuric ash into the atmosphere. Some of that went all the way up into the, uh, into the stratosphere, and it turns out that when you put sulfur dioxide in the stratosphere, it forms a sort of uh, haze, which, which can reflect uh, uh, one to two percent of the sunlight. It's like a sunscreen kind of, and that cooled the earth. So all of the, uh, of the heating of the earth that had happened over the previous roughly 100 years was reversed for a year or two after Mount Pinatubo until that sulfur dioxide eventually fell out of the atmosphere. Okay? So the scientists that we, uh, that we talk about, uh, and I think it's well understood scientifically, it's not, uh, it's, it's not even really very contentious that this, this would have the effect of cooling the earth. That may have, you know, the, the, the other complaints you might have about it might be legion, but it would probably work to cool the earth. But these guys have built, uh, their solution is essentially to build a 100,000 foot long garden hose uh, to which they, uh, which they hoist up by helium balloons. Uh, and it, uh, is, it, all you really need is to turn it, uh, turn the, 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 the handle, and you don't need very much sulfur dioxide. So what can come out of two garden hoses, one at the North Pole, one at the South Pole, is enough to cool the Earth essentially to whatever temperature that you would like it to be, according to the models. Okay, so that's the repugnant one. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, and I think many people think that that's like crazy. We're going to pollute some more to take care of the problem we've had from from polluting. Uh, the other one, which is sounds and feels a lot nicer, uh, is uh, uh, what, what's uh, a cloud whitening scheme. So the, the, the dark things absorb a lot of heat. The oceans are very, very dark. There are not very many clouds over the oceans uh, because there are not the nuclei that seed the clouds, which is usually from dust. There's not much dust over the oceans. Salt can also seed clouds, and so what you need to do is just figure out how to spray some salt water up into the air, and that can serve to, to, to make the clouds. And the belief is from the models that if you could just have 10,000 little solar-powered dinghies uh, that just puttered around in the oceans and flipped up some salt water into the air, that that would generate enough cloud cover over the oceans that it would reflect enough of the sunlight that through that channel you could also uh, uh, lower the temperature of the earth, uh, offset uh, any effects of, of warming uh, going forward. And that's, that's sort of what the chapter is. I mean, a lot of people say that by even raising those issues, you have suggested there's a low-cost way to deal with this problem and drain what political will there is for addressing uh, well, carbon emissions. Well, that would be a bit like, and I, it's actually an analogy we, we write in the book, it's a, it's a bit like 
blaming the heart surgeon uh, for rescuing uh, the guy who behaved badly. Um, did, would you like it to have not gotten to that point where he needed heart surgery? Yes. Uh, were there uh, risk factors that were of his own making and some that were entirely self-induced? Yes. Would a geoengineering solution create what you'd call an excuse to pollute, which again we address in the book? Quite possibly yes. That's not a reason to not entertain it as a solution if warming is the problem that you're trying to address. So, you know, the, the thing is, is we, um, I think why some people, especially who hadn't read the book and were kind of predisposed to, to be very distraught about these kind of solutions, what they felt when they did read the book is that, well, we did actually address a lot of the reservations about potential unintended consequences, about the excuse to pollute and so on. But instead of making it an argument that's very familiar, which is that, we've polluted way too much and we need to drastically stop now and it's our only chance. We discussed that, that f mode of thought, but instead of having that be kind of the 80% or the 90% of the argument as it typically is, and then the 10% where you kind of throw up your hands and say, gosh, what the heck do you do? Instead, we kind of use the 10% or 20% to say, this is the argument that we now know, that we've polluted way too much and that the current plan on the table is carbon mitigation and really that's the only thing that can work. And instead, we spend 70 or 80% looking at the problem differently and proposing some different solutions. So to me, the happiest news about this is that tomorrow, this has nothing to do with our book, but tomorrow on Capitol Hill are the first ever congressional hearings on geoengineering. So, you know, our argument is essentially that if the problem gets bad enough to worry about that cooling needs to happen, then it would be great for the, these guys who've been thinking about this, scientists, engineers of different types, to have a seat at the table, and I think that they're getting a seat at the table and we can really have that debate.